I am so excited for this topic and this guest today. You guys know we've talked so much about anxious attachment, but what we haven't really dove into deeply, which is crazy to me, is avoidant attachment. And so I have brought on the, honestly, of all the people that I've researched and gotten to know just from, you know, social media over the last few years. I think this person is truly the best to be talking about this topic with us. Ken Reed, welcome to Seeing Other People. Thank you very much, Alana. I really appreciate that. And thank you very much for the kind words. I have to say, um, I find avoidant attachment is usually the lesser of the attachment styles that are talked about. Um, And in that category, I also include fearful avoidance who are also called disorganized attachers because they don't get a lot of love from a lot of experts. But yeah, it's been a bit of a, a passion of mine to do the research on this. And I have to say, I think everyone who's been out in dating and, it, you know, to some degree, even in life, will have had plenty of experience with people who have a dismissive and or fearful avoidant attachment style. Yes, I can completely agree. And I do think it's interesting. In a way, it makes sense that it's the least talked about because the people who are anxious they want to figure out why am I anxious? Why is this thing happening to me? Like they're going to do the research, put in the work, take the time to figure that out. And the goal is to become secure or to find somebody who's secure. So we all know what that's like. Uh, We don't necessarily always know where to find it or how to become it, but people are more familiar with those two. But it is, I think, equally, if not more important to learn about what we're less familiar with or what we might encounter often. Um, And so I really appreciate you coming on. And I just love the way you take complex topics and explain them in a very digestible way. I think that's a really difficult thing to do sometimes and you are phenomenal at it. So I'm really excited to get into it here. Before we do, can you tell everybody a bit about yourself and what got you into counseling and specifically with the people that you mainly work with, you know, people who are going through like a quarter life crisis or who are dealing with relationship struggles or attachment issues? Like what led you to that path? Great question. Um, My short answer is going to be my own dating experiences with people who have an avoidant attachment style. Uh, One thing definitely led to another. Um, But if I had to go back in time and be like, huh, I wonder if my career is going to be counseling specifically with attachment styles. Never would have thought about it. Like it was never something that was camp- came top of mind. So what I do now. So I am a counselor based here in Sydney, Australia, but I work with clients overseas and I focus mostly on helping people who have had really bad experiences um, with sudden breakups where they've been blindsided. And it's typically um, from someone who has a pretty severe avoidant attachment style, which I'll get into in a minute. And um, I also help people work on becoming more securely attached and also working through quarter and midlife crises. And usually those two things coincide. I often find that people who come to me after being blindsided by you know, someone they dated who they thought they really loved only to have to pick up the pieces and realize they didn't, they're not going to have the future they thought they were going to have. It's a very intense recovery process that takes quite a while. And it's usually very multi-phase of like breakup recovery, working on your attachment style, and then also simultaneously going through a quarter midlife crisis of figuring out, okay, who am I? What am I doing with my life? And how do I work on myself too? So there's a lot there. And a lot of my clients have a degree of what we call developmental or um, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, CPTSD. So the attachment style and the developmental trauma all interlink. And that's why often a lot of people find themselves in these situationships and relationships with people of, you know, similar insecure attachment to them. And so it's really about helping people to overcome a lot of the patterns that have led them into these situationships and relationships in the first place. And for me, I had a really brutal situationship where um, I thought, in a nutshell, everything was phenomenal. I thought everything was going really well until suddenly I was told, you know, yeah, I just don't think I want to be in a relationship out of nowhere where everything seemed to be going really well. And it wasn't for, and for me, I had people coming at me being like, oh, well, if they wanted to, they would. And clearly they're just not that into you. And I was like, yeah, that doesn't really seem to match what I'm feeling in this particular situation. And in fact, that advice was just not really helpful at all. So I was really confused and I was like, what the hell just happened here? Like, you know, literally a day before I was being told like how amazing, you know, our connection, the chemistry was, and then next minute it's suddenly it's over without any involvement with me and the decision-making process. Like, 
how did my partner come up with this unilateral decision out of nowhere? And so at first I thought maybe this is just a freaky experience. Maybe I'm the only one who's gone through this. And then um, over time I did lots of therapy, research into attachment theory. And I was like, huh, now this is, my partner seems to have had, you know, avoidant attachment, I think, based on some of the research that I've done. Can't be 100% sure, still can't, if I'm completely honest. But over time, as I started working with clients on this, I realized a very alarming pattern where I was almost seeing my story played out in so many other cases that I started putting out content, you know, just thinking, ah, you know, I wonder if this is going to relate to anyone who's ever been in a very similar situation. And lo and behold, it's a goddamn pandemic. And I was like, oh, crap, this is... This is massive. This is way bigger than what I thought it was. And often I find a lot of people go through the same thing. They think they found their soulmate. They think they found someone. And this is the tricky thing is that these people for the most part are not narcissists. They're just very, you know, they could be charming. They could be fun loving. They can be, you know, amazing human beings who have a fear of intimacy. And my God, when that fear of intimacy hits, it's game over for a lot of relationships. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing. And I can imagine almost everyone listening was like nodding their head along with your story and myself included. I I can say, you know, from my experience, getting the rug, rug ripped out under from you, you know, thinking that you found the relationship that's going to be it, that you feel so happy in, and then suddenly your world flips upside down. It absolutely led me to a quarter life crisis and it also led me to feeling like I hit rock bottom and I changed pretty much everything about my life. I changed where I was living. I changed the career I had. I changed how I viewed myself in the world. And it can feel so scary and so isolating. Like I remember thinking like, I didn't know it was possible to feel this terrible every single Mm -hmm. day. And I think to your point of like, you weren't alone. Like it was eye-opening for you to realize, wow, so many other people have been in this situation. Like that's why I started this podcast because I felt so alone. I felt like there's no way that anybody else could possibly ever have been as hurt as I was. And the reality is most of us, unfortunately, go through pain like this that completely rocks our world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. hundred billion percent. I really relate with that. And I think also the scary thing is, is that in an age which seems to suggest, as I said before, you know, when it's a case of like, oh, well, if they wanted to, they would. It's very easy to shame spiral and to think we weren't enough or we were too needy. We were too difficult, too much. And it's that lack of clarity over what happened that I think eats people all alive. And the other thing too, is when you've been with someone who in your heart, you're still like, look, honestly, I thought they were my person. It can also do tremendous damage in the long run if you don't see that, yes, they are an amazing person with flaws and then probably not going to be your forever person. Like, you know, um, I know for you, you know, you're now engaged and about to get married, which is very exciting, by the way. But I mean, if someone had said to you, like, oh, by the way, you know, can you believe that in like, you know, around the time you had just been broken up suddenly, I can imagine that, you know, for you and for many people, if you were told, this is not actually going to be the person you're going to spend, you know, quite a lot of quality future time with. I think most of us would be like, what the hell are you talking about? Right. Right. And on the flip side, if you were told like, I know this isn't your person, like my gut reaction would be like, okay, so if they're not my person, can you tell me that you know that I will end up with somebody? Because if this person who I love so much, who I was willing to do everything and more for, couldn't love me, then who will? Yeah. Yeah. And I think also a common fear that I have uh, that I see a lot with clients who go through a situation like that is they often think that they're bequeathing their ex-partner all this amazing knowledge and wisdom on how to open up and be vulnerable and be loved. And then when they see that person rebound almost immediately into a new relationship where it seems like it's going very well, then people understandably think, oh God, I just gave my ex like the secrets on how to not only love, but also attract their soulmate. So what does mm-hmm. that mean? Am I just the learning lesson for all these people? But anyways, I know that's sort of like the little anecdotes of this stuff because the reality is all of this, like all of these feelings and experiences are very common signs and patterns of you dated someone who likely had an avoidant attachment style. 
Yes, correct. Okay, so let's back up for a minute. For those who are less familiar with attachment styles, can you just give a brief overview and then more specifically define what being avoidant actually means? Yes. Uh, So attachment styles are based on attachment theory, which came out way back when, and it was a research that was designed to help people understand the relationship between infants to their mums. And those that developed an anxious attachment style were shown to be very upset, visibly outraged at the loss of a caregiver, so fear of abandonment, Whereas those who are avoidantly attached, specifically dismissive avoidance, appeared not to be so bothered by the departure of a caregiver. They were like, eh, it's not a big deal. Those that were disorganized or had a fearful avoidant attachment style were more mixed in their overall reaction, where on the one hand, they demonstrated signs of hurt and frustration and anger from a fear of betrayal and also abandonment. But simultaneously, as the parent would get closer, they'd almost like push their caregiver away. So that's where those fears of intimacy and abandonment were rearing their head. Generally speaking, if we take a massive step back from that and look at attachment theory, if I'm being like really simplistic, people who have an anxious attachment have what we call a conscious fear of abandonment and a subconscious fear of intimacy. Whereas the avoidant attacher, those that are um, that are classically more dismissive avoidance, have a conscious fear of intimacy, which includes um, being emotionally close to a person, as well as also committing to a person that they're emotionally invested with. And the person who is a fearful avoidant attacher has all of that running at the surface. They're actively scared of abandonment and they're actively scared of being intimate and committed to a person they really care about too. So it's really paradoxical because often we find that those who have an avoidant attachment, it's really strange. Like why would anyone, especially someone who you know really loves you, why would they run from something they really like? And unfortunately, because a lot of these individuals have quite a degree of developmental trauma, they have learned over time that it is not safe to be that close to someone. So even if on one hand, they are absolutely yearning, thirsty for connection, and they're incredibly lonely at heart because they don't know how to build those connections, they're also allergic to it because it takes them back to a time when for a lot of these people, they may have had a really overbearing parent. They were, you know, in very, you know, overbearing relationships where their mom or their dad was expecting way too much of them as a child, basically t- making them out to be like their therapist or having a very inappropriate, what we call emotional relationships with their child, where it was just a lot of emotional dumping and trauma bonding with the kid without letting that child actually have their own sense of self or their own individuality. And also the other core part of it is neglect. You know, a lot of these children may have been sent to boarding schools where they weren't given enough time and also care from their parents And they may have felt like they've just had all their choice and agency taken from them as a child. And so now in adult relationships, and this includes friends, they may find that, you know, they have their walls up. They don't let people get too close. It can be superficial and fun. You'll often feel like you're dating these people and it feels like it's amazing until it gets to a certain point where you just start to notice like these little things of, I feel like I can't even express how I'm feeling to this person without them having like a reaction to it. Or you'll notice, and this is the infamous one, but I think everyone listening will understand this, like especially if you're now dating, when you've been getting along really well with someone where you feel everything's going great, and then all of a sudden, like over time, you just feel like this moment where your stomach like drops and you're like, something's just shifted in the energy. And it's almost marked by a text message where all of a sudden, you you know, you're like, you're trying to reach out to this person and they say, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just really busy at work. And you notice that there's a palpable shift in the energy and the dynamic. And I can see you're nodding because I'm like, I think this is, this is something that everyone's gone through. <laughs> and and oh, it's yes. one of those, it's very scary because often you may rationalize in those moments. Yeah, well, I guess everyone's really busy in this example and it's totally fine. But the fact of the matter is that many avoidance use coping mechanisms like workaholism, drug addiction, sex addiction, all the addictions to manage a lot of their, you know, their feelings of, intense pain and unworthiness inside of them. And that comes up for them when they get close to someone. So the closer they get to another person, that's when they lose control of a lot of their compartmentalizing. That's when they start to feel really bad about themselves. And they may, 
project a lot of these feelings onto the person that they're interacting with and be like, oh, well, they're clearly not the right person for me. If I'm feeling this way, clearly you're not the one for me. And they may start second guessing themselves being like, maybe that, you know, I'm just not in love with you, even though I think I'm in love with you. Maybe this is just infatuation. So often we find that a lot of these people, they'll, um, after a period of intense lovemaking where everything felt great, it just suddenly crumbles where they'll rationalize and be like, yeah, you know, I just don't think, you know, you're the one for me. You know, I love you, but I don't love you. You know, I love you like a friend or a family member. And to the person hearing this, it's so confusing. It's like, hang on a minute. We've been dating for like years and now you're telling me all this, like what the hell's going on? Or it could have just been a short situation ship as well too, of like two to four months. And so I think what really catches people off guard in these dynamics is one, they never saw it coming. Two, the signs are very subtle. Like if you don't know what fear of intimacy looks like, frankly, it's going to take you completely, you know, it's going to catch you off guard. And I think it is one of those cases where even when you have a situation to break up, it can floor you. People often will have, you know, relatives who've died, friends who may have passed away suddenly, but there's something particularly painful and brutal about the loss of a potential soulmate who just leaves you out of nowhere where they're still alive and you've just got thousands of questions and none of them are going to be answered by this person because unfortunately much of the time they don't even know why they're reacting this way and it's just sad that oh my god there are so many things that you just said that i was like yes this that um and, well to go off your last point with the situation ships ending or something that was like short-lived ending like we then feel so much guilt around like or shame around why why we're so upset about this thing when we should be more upset about the family member who's sick or like the bigger things going on but yeah it is crazy that it feels like somebody died yet they're walking around they're going on dates with other people they're mm -hmm. continuing on their life and you're here suffering asking why was i not enough why am, does this mean i'm not enough am i not good enough like we are so quick to put the blame on us. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to kind of what we were saying in the beginning too, where we're always like, why not me? Like, why can't I be loved? What's wrong with me? Where in a way we're almost like so selfish to think that it's always our fault. Yeah. We're always about us, but who are like, we're not going to sit there and be like, yeah, they were too avoidant. And that's not for me to, you know, but then it's like, well, maybe I could have helped them or fixed them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly right. And also on the flip side, just to make it very clear for our listeners, there are unfortunately cases where it's, you know, it's genuinely a case of the other person. It, it's not necessarily an attachment issue. They're just not into you, but it can be hard to discern that difference unless you know what it feels like. And I think that it's very easy for some people to go either or with this, where they take, as you said, too much accountability and they're like, must be something about me that this person didn't want to be with me. I clearly wasn't enough of them. They're going to find someone better. They've already found someone better. Look how happy they appear to be in this new relationship. They're escalating things. They've got a kid together. They're getting married versus, you know, I know some other people just rake their exes across the coals without taking any personal accountability whatsoever, where they're like, they were a cheating narcissist. And look, if they were an actual cheating narcissist, go ahead and use those terms. That's totally fine. But I think the key thing is I prefer to use, you know, the evidence you have to describe the experience you had rather than just coming up with a bunch of labels and names to describe something that didn't actually happen. Cause that's also a form of invalidation. So why would you do that to yourself? So I think balance is missing in a lot of these cases where in the aftermath it's either they're all evil or i'm to blame for everything and it's that's not the truth in the in much of these cases yeah for sure what about the situation in which you feel like let's say in your example like you you got that text or they said that thing that made your stomach flip and you feel like okay like maybe they're pulling away or maybe there's all this evidence to suggest that my partner, this person who I love, who I'm in this relationship with is avoidant. Like, I don't want them to just let this go, but I also don't know what's going on in their mind. How can that partner like bring this up with them in a way that doesn't make them just like freak out? Well, 
that's the million dollar <laughs> question, isn't it? Um, mm-hmm. My answer is I don't think you can. Like, I mean, yeah. because at the end of the day, it's up to that person as to whether they feel safe or not too. You know, a lot of people understandably learn so much about attachment styles and like, ah, I've got it. I know what I need to do. I know how to give this person what they need. They just need space. They just need time to regulate and be by themselves. Doesn't quite work as easily as it sounds. You know, the way I, I've done this when I've dated people in the past is I've often said to them, hey, you know, gently, I um, really enjoy spending time with you. I've just noticed there's a shift in terms of the amount of energy and consistency that's been happening between us. You know, I generally prefer to have a bit more consistency in this, you know, keen to know where your head's at and how you're feeling about the situation. That's generally how I phrase it. And usually the responses you'll get back are, oh, you know, I'm not pulling away. I'm fine. Everything's okay. Because much of the time you've got to understand a lot of avoidant attachers are big people pleasers. They don't often know what's going on inside of themselves because they're not really connected with their emotions. And they themselves are not people who necessarily want to hurt people either. That is the last thing they want to do. So often you'll get these responses where, you know, they make out like everything's okay. And you can, to your best effort, try and get closer, try and find out what's going on, try and, you know, help them in a way to open up about what they're going through much of the time they want. And that's depending, like, on the severe end, I should say. Like, you know, some milder avoidant attachers might embrace the discomfort to open up with how they're feeling. But the problem is, is that if these people feel like they can't open up for fear of, you know, being screamed at, yelled at, being told that they're a bad person, which is a huge core wound for many avoidant attachers, they're just not going to do it. And at that point, it almost becomes you know, seconds to midnight, so to speak, before this situationship or relationship is about to have a major end or one of many that's yet to come because uh, sometimes it's not just one and done. I've seen some cases where many fearful avoidance in particular will boomerang back and forth where they'll engage in these very intense cycles of like, you know, getting with you, breaking up with you, taking some time away and then rinse and repeat, getting back, breaking up, getting back, breaking up. So to answer your question, is there a way to communicate effectively in a secure way, you know, how to connect with your person when you feel your gut lurch and you feel them pulling away? The best thing you can do is bring it to their attention, but if they don't necessarily act on that, I don't think there's anything more that you can do. It might be a sign that, you know, this person's going to shut down and it is what it is. Yeah, I. it is so hard and, you know, it's the type of situation where you want to bring it up because you care and you want to, you know, do what it takes to make this relationship work, but you can't both. I heard a a metaphor earlier where it's like, if one, in order to move a couch, like it's really hard to move a couch on your own. Uh But if the, if two people are moving a couch, it's a lot easier, but one person, you're not going to be able to get the couch all the way up the flight of stairs by yourself, but two people can. And it's the same with a relationship. Like you can't, you can't do the work for both of you. You can't save something, fix something, heal something for somebody else. Absolutely not. And that's a great analogy. And I think that a lot of us forget that. I think a lot of us think, oh, you know, we can help them. We can also make a safe room for the couch that we're metaphorically holding on together as well too. (laughs) And it's like, yeah, you can do that. But at the end of the day, in this case, the couch has got, you know, a bit of autonomy on itself. Um, or the other person. Yeah, the couch can move itself. The couch has legs. <laughs> the couch has legs. And I'll tell you what, if that couch, you know, regardless of whether you put that in a safe, you know, a seemingly healthy environment, I'll tell you what, if that couch doesn't feel it inside of itself, it's going to bolt out the window and be like, ciao. And you're left with, you know, property damage and, you know, a lot of memories of what it was like to have the couch in the room. Um, but the point is, is that, you know, this is a key thing I, I really want to stress for our listeners is, you know, what is, when we refer to, you know, creating a kind, warm, emotionally safe environment for someone, if you haven't grown up with that, your nervous system is not familiar with that. Unfortunately, even though consciously, you know, you and I, Alana, we can talk about how love is respect, reciprocity, consistent, see, kindness, and all these really good adjectives. If someone's subconscious, a lot of that internal emotional world is not used to that. It's more used to chaos. It's more used to drama. It's more used to emotional absence. And it gets triggered by, you know, something that's chill, calm, loving, inviting. 
best of luck to you because it's not going to be an environment that feels safe to the person with avoidant attachment. So I think it's really important for people to remember that you can do everything you can to facilitate what's traditionally healthy, but traditionally healthy is probably going to set these people off. Let's say the person who is avoidant recognizes that or they they are ready. They're like, yes, you know what? You're right. And that's something I've been avoiding dealing with. Or you know what? Like a lot of what you said like does resonate with me. And I all this to say, like, what if the person who is avoidant, whether in a relationship or out of a relationship, like wants to quote unquote do the work? What does the work look like? Because I think people throw around the phrase a lot, like do the work. And besides like going to therapy, what is the work? How does the work get done? And are you able to do the work while in a relationship or do you have to be on your own? Gosh, me, like so many great questions. Um, Okay, so let's start with like, if you're an avoidant attacher listening to this, whether you're fearful or dismissive and you're like, this is me, I need help, I need to work on myself, congratulations. That's the first step. I'm glad that you've identified this about yourself because I tell you what, there are many people with avoidant attachment who have strong denial and they often don't want to recognize this about themselves because, again, it goes to their core wound of feeling like they're a bad person. My answer is you're not a bad person, but these are things that you need to take care of. Otherwise, this behavior can be abusive in the long run. So um, I think the first thing I would say is if you're someone who identifies that you have avoidant attachment, the first thing I would actually do is just do some basic homework about this just to see if this is something that resonates with you. I'd say steer clear of places like Reddit and social media because the avoidant hatred is very real online and you probably don't need that because that's just going to make things harder for you. I would say that when it comes to learning your attachment style, the key thing for many avoidance is they're very disconnected from their emotions. We often say they're alexithymic, meaning that they don't recognize or articulate how they're feeling very well. And it's all a bit of a jumbled mess. So one of the key things after doing a lot of this research is I think it's really important for them to seek out a practitioner who has an understanding of developmental trauma has a practice like, say, internal family systems therapy, and I'll talk more about these in just a hot second, and also is able to be confronted by connection because problematically, a lot of avoidance bounds from therapy. They'll usually come in for adjacent reasons like anxiety, ADHD, which are relevant. But often when, you know, that talk therapy is being engaged and they're actually starting to work on building a rapport with the clinician, that's when they start to freak out and bounce as well too because fear of intimacy. So it's really important for them to have a clinician where they can take it really slowly. So you asked, what is the work and what does this involve? Okay, so when we talk about the inner work, I think there are many components to it. I think that in my experience with myself and also my clients, one is just even doing your basic homework, like I mentioned, like, okay, let's find out more about me and how I behave and how I respond, because then that way it builds up your self-awareness and you're not going to be reacting out of denial. Secondly, I think it's also about, okay, once you've got your head on board and you're also more on top of that, it's about challenging some of your belief systems. And they might be for the avoidant attacher, I am a bad person, there's one. Um, And particularly if you're a fearful avoidant, another one is people are just going to leave me all the time and it's never safe to love because people are always out to get me. It's really important to understand that challenging belief systems isn't just affirmation work. Infamously, affirmations don't work for a lot of people because what a surprise, they don't talk about how you're feeling emotionally. A great example of this might be if you hear me say, okay, you know, I am safe. A lot of people internally might scream out, no, I'm not. I'm not safe. I can't trust anyone. That's the part we need to address. So when we say doing the inner work, it's about addressing that subconscious emotional part of us that's not in alignment with how we're thinking in the moment. So we might, so for example, you know, when we're doing the work, it's really about getting deep into that emotional part of us that does not feel like we're safe, does not feel like we're enough, does not feel like we are a good person and being like, okay, why is it that I feel this way inside of myself? And that's where, you know, a therapeutic practice like internal family systems therapy can really be helpful. And to break that down very simply, That's about trying to connect with individual parts of ourselves that hold on to those emotions very tightly of, I'm not good enough, I'm a bad person, and starting to unburden and unload a lot of that stuff. A lot of that has a lot of shame to it. A lot of it has a lot of anxiety and fear attached to it. And the goal 
of really working through these parts of ourselves that holds tightly onto all of this stuck emotion is to release that. So that way, when you are in relationships with other people, you're not as triggered. You still will probably feel a degree of triggering, but you're not to a point where you're reacting so violently or so abusively in a safe relationship. You're like, actually, I can do this. I can challenge myself and I'm not getting overwhelmed by my deactivating um, symptoms that I can't control myself. Because I think a key thing to understand for a lot of people who have an avoidant attachment style is they're not intending to shut down on people. It's very, you know, it's a very automatic response from that person's brain. Like their limbic system, the fight, flight, freeze, fawn part of them just goes total control at that point in time. So even when, for example, you know, you're having a breakup chat with an avoidant attacher, they're not thinking logically or rationally at that particular point in time. Sure, they might sound like they know what they want and that what they're doing is like perfectly reasonable, but they often aren't actually aware of how they're feeling inside of themselves because they're so engulfed. So the whole point about this, about the inner work is to get them to a point where that emotional part of them doesn't take over anymore and they can be more grounded, rational, and more functional in a relationship. And the last part of your question was, is this something you're able to do alone, you know, with a therapist or in a relationship? I'd actually say you need to do both. You need to be able to engage with, you know, a good therapist. I'd say you need an accountability team. I'm also going to say that I know a lot of avoidant attachers unfortunately have addiction issues as well too to manage those intense emotions inside of them. I'd argue that needs to be worked on first and then start doing the inner work. And you need an accountability team to call you out because the chances of you shutting down and deactivating on a partner, frighteningly high. So you really need to be aware that it's probably going to happen and you need people to call you out if it does happen so that if you want to engage in a long-term relationship, that way you've actually got good people, you know, helping you out through this process. So that's my answer to that question. I thank you for such thoughtful and just want amazing answers. I think I love what you said about the accountability team. I think that's so important because it goes back to this idea that like, we feel like we're alone in what we're going through and we're not. We like, even if we feel like, well, nobody near me or close to me can understand. Okay. But you're still, you don't have to be alone. The more likely, or the more you lean on the people in your life to help you through something, the more likely you'll get through it a little bit easier. And it sounds like it, it really is, like you said, like the first step is awareness, but then it's these little moments of like, okay, I know that this thing is happening. I know what I've done in the past. Why don't I try something different, even though it's scary, but I think I can maybe do it. Okay. I can't fully do it, but I can do it a little. Okay. The world didn't end. Things didn't crash and burn. I'm still standing and just baby steps closer to making those changes. Yes. You absolutely nailed it. And I think that's the key thing is baby steps. I know a lot of avoidant attachers who are very well-intentioned come into therapy with intensity. They want this issue fixed. They want it resolved. And one of the key things as a clinician is you have to understand you are not dealing with an anxious attacher at this point in time. When you're working with someone who has an avoidant attachment style, you have to treat them differently, not because they're bad, not at all, but because their nervous system, their wiring is so fundamentally different from someone who's maybe mildly secure or anxiously attached. And that means you need to challenge their shutdown responses of connection and you also need to take things slowly. Often the best results with people who have an avoidant attachment style take years. And frankly, the recovery journey is five years plus, I'd say, for a lot of these folks. I work with a lot of avoidant attachers, but this, the move to becoming more secure is glacial, but that's okay. That's how it works for a lot of these folks. And I know it's going to be painful to hear because a lot of these people don't want to think, oh, I'm going to spend five plus years in therapy working on myself, which I get. But the reality is, is that, you know, if you try and rush this, again, those defenses will activate and they'll bounce and they'll then, just like in dating, they'll be through five plus different therapists where they'll be like, oh, therapy wasn't working for me. I just haven't found the right therapist. And I mean, that's mm -hmm. a line we've also heard from them in dating too. I haven't found the right person <laughs> yes. yet. Yes. Which speaking of which I, before we got on, I posted a question box asking people what specifically they wanted us to talk about in this episode. And I got a few responses, one of which in all caps was OMG, it's me. How do I stop finding problems with men? Ooh. And 
for for more context, um, this is a listener I, I I know, and she's in her early mid thirties, and from her perspective, she had she's be she was single for so long that she became so independent that even though she wants to find somebody, I think she's very afraid that finding somebody and like being with somebody is so out of the realm of like what makes sense based on her lifestyle that she's been living. But she wants to, and she goes on dates with new people all the time, and she immediately finds something wrong with them on the first date. Okay, so that flaw finding, firstly, I get it, I respect it, I understand where that's probably coming from. Not so fun to be on the receiving end of it, though. But um, I get it in the sense that, you know, if I'm working with a client who's presenting with that, I'd be like, okay, this flaw finding even though it's getting in your way of finding true love, it's actually trying to help you. Like, you know, my first step to a person who's going through that would be like, it's like, okay, let's take a step back. What do you think the purpose of this flaw finding actually is? Like, what do you think it's trying to do for you? Maybe it's trying to protect you from making the wrong choice. Maybe it's trying to protect you from getting close because there was a time where getting close meant betrayal, meant abandonment. And I'd start working my way from there because maybe, and this is usually where it comes from, I find that part that is trying to floor find in others is a very protective part that may be what I would describe as an external critic, someone who where, you know, as soon as you sit down with someone, they're just finding all the ways in which this person in front of you is not good for you, is not meant for you. And I think one of the best things you can do in a clinical setting is actually start to challenge and work through that and be like, okay, how is this part trying to help me? How can I try and tell this misguided part of me to relax? I'm not in danger. It's okay. I think we all, to a degree, have an element of judgment that we bring to the table in dating. Discernment is important. I don't think we, unfortunately, in this day and age, I don't think we can go in dating without a bit of that because it's very easy to be hurt by other people who have undiagnosed mental health issues, for sure. But when it gets to that extent where it's destroying your chances of just accepting another person, you clearly have a part of you that's out of control and it's obviously from a place of survival, but you need to work on that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it is actually very relatable. I know someone else said, how do I know if I'm being too guarded? And I think if you're asking that question or if you're noticing like, I find problems with everyone or I don't give anyone a second date because I don't think I would have anything to talk to them about on a second date. Like, There's got to be a reason and it's more likely within than that there's actually something wrong with every single one of these people. 100 billion percent. Like if you're finding yourself constantly turning away away people being like, they're not the right person for me. Again, this requires context because, you know, there's a difference between someone who is, you know, going through dating and for one reason or other, it just, it doesn't feel right. And that's down to intuition, which is a much more subtle thing to feel in my experience versus when you've got this loud, judgy voice in your head that is tearing people down left, right and center, and you're pushing people away without actually giving them a proper opportunity. Worse, Mm -hmm. you like these people, but a part of you gets in the way of that and doesn't even allow you to connect with them for very long because you have these fears that they're going to, you know, somehow hurt or leave. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe they won't. Like, you'd, I think a lot of us would be surprised if we tried that doing that thing that scares us. Like I said before, like, the world might not explode. Like, you might not spontaneously combust. You might get through it. You might learn something. You might experience, like, oh, wow, I thought that would feel horrible and it, it feels okay. Um, but you don't know until you try, but it all starts with awareness. Um, percent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got a few other questions that people send in really amazing questions and I really want to help them out. So the first one says, I understand that attachment theory is based largely on how you were and were not supported from zero to three years old. As a 30 year old, looking back on my relationships, I feel like my attachment style is actually more dependent on the person that I'm with. The situationship who makes me anxious, the best friend who confesses his love to me makes me avoidant. The closest thing I've come to having a secure relationship ended for reasons seemingly more complicated than attachment theory. Can you help explain this? How do your adult relationships, romantic, familial, platonic, affect your attachment style? Can a series of unhealthy relationships turn you anxious if your childhood made you secure? How do you weigh childhood experiences with adult experiences when understanding someone's attachment? 
Gosh me, that's a fabulous question. Um, okay, to this person who asked that question, I love that. That's awesome. Okay, so I have my own unique take on attachment theory, and this is not something that's actively published or necessarily backed by hard and fast research, just my own clinical experience. What I'm going to say is this. Um, it's true that your formative years of development are very much impacted by your caregivers because if you think about it they're the closest people to you they model what's you know feels like love to your nervous system so understandably that's going to shape you know how you relate to people with those big fears of intimacy or those big fears of abandonment or both so that can be a thing there so that being said when we say in attachment theory that your attachment style can fluctuate depending on the person you're with that is true to a point in my opinion what I mean by that is I could be with someone where I myself, you know, I'm a recovering mildly anxiously attached person. You know, I might be with someone who has a very big anxious attachment and that makes me, that makes that avoidant part of me flare up and I just want to push that person away. Um, but I want to make it clear that's not due to a fear of intimacy at that particular point in time. It's more of like, get the hell away from me. This is too much. And that, and I, this is where I think context and nuance is really important because not every case is the same. Whereas I know for me, I'm drawn to more people who have a more avoidant leaning. And that's when, you know, that stuff plays itself out in the infamous anxious and avoidant dynamic. People who are more avoidant when they're with someone who's more avoidant than them is not pretty. They often go through the exact same scenario as those of us who are more anxiously attached go through. For instance, if you have two fearful avoidance together, it is like the anxious and avoidant trap on steroids. It's just mega you know, cases of like being extremely, you know, needy and dependent on the other fearful avoidant, then having these shutdown episodes where you storm out of the home or tell the other person to leave. And that goes on for quite a while. You might have two dismissive avoidants who get together where that first they're like, hooray, I found someone who's just as independent as I am. And it seems like this is going to be perfect only for there to be like emotional absence between the two of them where they get to a point where it's like, oh, I only see my romantic partner once a year. And it's like, oh, Jesus Christ, like we've now got a serious issue. And that's challenging for these people because it's like, well, I thought space was the ultimate gift we could give to a person. It's like, yeah, but not that much. Like that's where your needs come undone. And inevitably, usually one of those partners will cheat, move on very quickly because it's just fizzled out. So it's true that your attachment style um, can fluctuate, you know, depending on the people that you're with, to that listener or that person who asked that question, can bad relationships have an impact on my own attachment style? Absolutely it can. But here's what I'm going to say. I will. I don't believe that, for instance, I could ever be avoidantly attached. Like, I just don't have that strong fear of intimacy. Like, for someone to have that, I don't have the core wounds of I am a bad person. I have definitely had the I'm not enough core wound, which I think is universal for a lot of people with developmental trauma. But I just, like, when I work with avoidant clients and when I work with people who are you know more anxiously attached I can see clear lines of differences in terms of the thinking patterns the behavior you know the different kinds of work that we're doing so that's why I say yes it's true that depending on the person you're with there can be degrees of difference the fact of the matter is there is also a neurobiological component to a lot of this which means mm -hmm. we're all a little bit different and we're all going to show up in very particular ways to the point where even if, you know, yes, the, the style that's presenting in the relationship we're talking about may shift a little bit, you as a person, your personality as well too, I believe it has a degree of fixedness to it as well too, where it's just like, you know, for you, Alana, you know, for instance, you might have like a fearful avoidant attachment style, you might be more secure. It's true that your secure base might be disrupted over time, but you're probably never going to be that avoidant unless it was something part of your disposition already for instance if that makes sense so there's that component and then i think with regards to what this person was asking is you know you know how can we think about this in relation to individual cases where it wasn't really down to attachment theory that's true often it's not mm -hmm. often it could also be a case of incompatibilities that rise up you could have a difference of political opinion which is the foundation of where both of you are like yeah i just don't think we're a fit for each other that can happen. It's not always down to attachment related issues. A lot of the time it is, but the fact of the matter is, is that relationships are more than just attachment styles at the end of the day as well too. So there can be real relationships where you're like, you get along just great, but you fundamentally, you have different values or alignments. So context is key. The devil is in the detail.
you took the words or the thought right out of my mouth because I was going to ask going off of all that, do you think we sometimes we get in the habit of over over prescribing? Like maybe the situationship that makes that made this person anxious, well, it, it, maybe it just made you anxious because it was a situationship, which is by definition an undefined situation that's really fucking confusing. And maybe the best friend who confessed their love, maybe you just didn't like them, and you didn't know how to you know confront to or tell them that hey, I don't like you. So I feel like we often try and like we're so quick to put a term to a thing or like how we were talking about before, like people will jump to say that person's a narcissist. Maybe they're just an asshole or maybe they just didn't like you and you're now taking it and spinning it in a way that makes you feel a little bit better of, oh, you ended up with this horrible person who set out to do bad things to you. Yeah. I love that you um, you brought this out because I think this is really key is, and it goes back to what I said earlier, which is if the labels, if the descriptors are true to your experience and feel true to your experience, go ahead. I'm not here to police and gatekeep, you know, clinical verbiage. Attachment styles aren't a diagnosis and not yet. Uh, and there's something that I think it's, e- to be honest, it's easy for me to see in people because I'm like, oh, I can feel you showing up one way more than another way. And that's really easy for me to identify as someone who sees a lot of this sort of stuff. But if we put all that to one side, this is where I have to, you know, it's going to be very uncomfortable for people to hear this. At the end of the day, we don't know if your partner actually has an avoidant attachment style. We don't know if your partner has, you know, full-blown narcissistic personality disorder. That person could simply just not like you. And, you know, another thing to think about too, stages of development. You know, I know when I was younger and in dating, I acted very avoidant, but I don't think I have an avoidant attachment style. Meaning that when I was dating initially, I wasn't looking for love. I was just like, I'm here to, excuse my French, fuck around and find out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's one of those things where when you're younger and you're not really in that position to look for adult secure love, you know, you can be behaving in very different ways because you're just like, I'm just a kid who wants to have fun in the candy store and I want to pick my candy until I get to a point where it makes me feel unwell. And so I think that we've got to also take into consideration that whilst adult attachment is more likely to have symptoms of attachment styles. Putting that all to one side for a minute, though, there are so many other factors that are involved as well, too, that are, you know, not just limited to Mm -hmm. attachment theory. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'm, I'm teetering back and forth between two questions. Let's choose one of them. I think they're both pretty good. I will give you the choice between the person who is terrified of going on a date and the person who says they know they're self-sabotaging. Oh, um, let's take the person who knows they're self-sabotaging. Okay. I'm in a three-year pattern that I know I need to break. I'm potentially self-sabotaging with the emotionally available men that I'm choosing. I find myself doubling down with my affection when a boy starts to pull away and I'm in a deep spiral of pretty girl comparison and jealousy and fear of abandonment. I do not trust people now when they say they have feelings for me, which is making me more avoidant than I've ever been. So cue the question, how do I break this cycle? How do I heal my attachment wounds while honoring my anxiously attached tendencies? How do I trust someone when they say they're excited about me? What advice do you have for when I start to date, which won't be for a while right now? Right now, I'm more excited about pottery and sourdough than men. I'm 30. (laughs) I would love to find a secure version of myself and eventually a secure version of love, but I'm feeling pretty scared of getting hurt again. I don't want to continue perpetuating this idea that relationship equals heartbreak and rejection. Oh, yeah. I love that. Um, So, okay. Here's an assumption that I'm going to make off the back of this. This is sounding like someone who at the very least has an anxious attachment based on what I'm hearing. Um... And I am only saying that because to me, the big dominant theme here seems to be fear of abandonment that seems to be playing out, which by the way, very valid. You had your heart broken enough times by people out in dating. I get it. You'd probably be like, the pottery seems like a great escapist choice to me. And hey, you should Pottery can break, but it won't break my heart. (laughs) That's exactly true. And honestly, I'd actually, I'd say, please keep up the pottery because it's a really good act of self-love. I think that's great. Now, In terms of challenging you, though, um, firstly, I just want to say I really get it. 
I'm really sorry that you've been in a situation where you're now experiencing this because that's a terrible situation to be in. You might be experiencing a term of what we call love anorexia, where now things like pottery become a way of avoiding love out of fear of being hurt, which is very valid. A lot of people experience that. So let's talk about how to challenge this. I think the key thing I would say is, just as a universal disclaimer, is unfortunately we can never 100% guarantee that we're not going to be hurt in love. Like that's just a case with a lot of that stuff too. I would say what I'm hearing is there's still a lot of fear of being hurt again off the back of previous experiences. So I'd actually probably start with that. Like if I was your, if I was your counselor, I'd be like, okay, we're not going to push you back out into dating anytime soon. You know, you've been hurt by previous relationships. That ain't the solution for you right now. Let's talk more about like what led you to this position of, you know, being where you're at right now and working through some of that fear and anxiety that you have. Because when I've had people come to me in the past being like, I never want to date again off the back of this situationship breakup, I'm like, fair enough. It's not about encouraging people to live a life in the mountains. It's more about saying right now, you're understandably very scared and rattled off the back of what you've been through. Fair enough. Maybe right now what you need is just time to actually feel safe in your body again. And that leads into trust. How can I discern what's healthy for me and what's not? Well, something in this might suggest to me that you might not consciously, but subconsciously be drawn to people who do hurt and abandon or betray you, which means maybe be good to think about, okay, is this something to do with experiences of growing up with people who are like this? Because often I find that the people who take rejection and betrayal the hardest have often, interestingly enough, been people who've had similar experiences growing up as well too. So I think that should also be examined as well. And even if there wasn't, it may not be something that you've had in your lifetime. I know a lot of people carry a lot of emotion from their, you know, their grandparents as well too. Like a lot of this stuff can be passed down the lines due to epigenetics. So it may not be something you've experienced with your current you know, caregivers as you were growing up. It may be something from theirs uh, when they were kids. But uh, the other thing I also want to throw in there and say is that I think the key thing in terms of discernment and trust is also connecting again with your body. One of the key things that's fabulous about our, you know, our intuition is the fact that the more you connect internally with yourself and you also start self-advocating for yourself and being like, okay, when I'm in a situation or when I'm dating someone and I don't feel good, I need to speak up for myself. I need to also get to a point where I have some boundaries and can protect myself. I may not be able to insulate myself from a surprise ending all of the time, but do I have the resources, the right people to turn to to help me overcome this and get through it? I can assure people that having been through many situationship endings, it's gotten far easier for me to navigate through them because I'm at a point where I'm like, Yep, I can see the writing was on the wall in those particular cases, or I could see that maybe it wasn't a good fit and something I brought to the table that I need to work on. But I think when you're in a situation like listening to this person is right now, the key thing I think is working through a lot of that inner stuff that's, you know, making you feel like it's unsafe to go out and dating. I don't trust anyone. I'd start with by saying, I think you need to start connecting with your own emotional side too, to feel like you can trust yourself in making better choices. They're not going to be perfect right off the bat, but I think that's the first step to a lot of, you know, healing the self-sabotaging behavior. Absolutely. And I think, you know, when it, you're in the position where you so badly want a relationship, like it almost feels terrifying to take a step away from dating because you feel like you might miss out on somebody mm-hmm. or you're going to, you know, lose sight of the timeline that you wanted for yourself. But your relationship with yourself is the most important relationship you'll ever have in your entire life. And we owe it to ourselves to take that time to make ourselves feel good and learn what we do and don't need. And, you know, take time away from what's hurting us so that we can check in with ourselves and figure out like how we can feel, like you said, like safe moving forward in our own bodies. 100%. And I can see one thing that I didn't address, which is they ask, how do I trust someone when they say they're excited about me? Well, one thing I wanted to say is I think a lot of people who are excited about you are genuine when they say they're excited about you. But I think Mm -hmm. one thing that I've learned over time with dating is if that person is really intense, like they're someone who's like trying to escalate things very quickly, that to me suggests that this person you're seeing may have a dysregulated nervous system they may be on one hand genuinely enthusiastic about getting to know you but if they're that quick that for me is a bit of a warning light 
on its way to a red flag because, and I know you've talked about this in previous episodes as well on your podcast, is intensity and butterflies and great 10-hour dates are not indicators of this is a sustainable, loving relationship. And people who are susceptible to that have usually come from very emotionally neglectful you know, backgrounds where they may have felt like they didn't get enough love. So it's dangerous when they're with something like that and they're not used to it because they may think, oh, this means it's perfect when it's like for now, yes. But yeah. it could be me it could mean that you're actually particularly vulnerable to just, you know, relying on what this person is showing you, what you're feeling, rather than looking at the bigger picture. Yeah, hundred percent. Perfect, perfect way to end, which I do not want to end. This has been so incredible. Ken, thank you so much for being here. But before I let you go. Last question is a question I ask every guest and we might have to go spit fire on this one uh, because of the clock, but what is the best piece of dating or relationship advice you've ever received or have to give? Oh, okay. Yes. Um, it's not so much advice. It's more of just something to keep in mind is people are only going to feel safest and also capable of giving you love when they're at a similar emotional level to yourself. Meaning mm -hmm. that if you're someone who has a great capacity, great capacity for emotional intimacy and the person you're with is simply at a different level to you, that, you know, that can also be the foundation for something not working out very well in the long run. You may have all these great parts of you on paper. You have shared interests. You get along really well. But if you two can't build that building block of actually getting together because, you know, someone is still trapped in their childhood trauma versus someone who's well and truly beyond it, you're batting at two different leagues. And I think people forget that. They think that, you know, oh, well, if I have the tall guy, if, I, if I'm, I want that guy from finance who's 6'5 and, you know, has a trust fund. <laughs> blue eyes. And blue eyes, yeah. It's like, that's great in theory. But if, you know, if that guy has the emotional maturity level of, you know, a toddler, no disrespect to the guy from finance, it's, you know, it's probably not going to work out in the long run. And we are drawn to people who share a similar emotional level to ourselves. So, Bear that in mind because that does dominate a lot of these experiences. Absolutely. Ken, thank you so much for being here. Where can everybody find you and are you accepting new clients? So people can find me at kenry.co, which is uh, my handle on Instagram and TikTok. I mostly post on Instagram and everything else gets distributed across my other socials. Uh, guys go follow him literally the second like I'm not even kidding one of the best follows you will ever follow thank you very much I really appreciate the recommendation and if you want to work with me specifically I am still working my way through a big wait list and so I'm not currently accepting any clients at the moment but that being said I am I do have a great team of people I'm so grateful for the people that I have working for me um that you can check out and see they're just as knowledgeable and as experienced at working with people on attachment styles. And I'm also in the pro process of working through a few alternative offers to help people through this. I mean, even if you can't work with me, you know, I know a lot of people enjoy watching my content on social media and sometimes that's sufficient for a lot of people. But if you are interested, don't be afraid to, you know, express your interest because I'm sure there's a way that I can find a way to obviously facilitate things, you know, within reason, of course, you know, between my team and I. But other than that, though, yeah, that's where you can find me. And that's my current status with my work. Amazing. Ken, thank you so much, everybody. KenReed.co everywhere. And we will talk to you next time.